<laughs> yeah, it is. It's like the filters are working. So that's, uh, uh, I, I guess it's a good thing. So, but uh, hello, welcome everyone to another episode of Office Hours. We're going to be discussing all things Microsoft 365 and answering questions from the community. Community, community, community. <laughs> I need to have an effect or something. Uh, my name is Christian Buckley. I'm an Office Apps and Services MVP and Microsoft Regional Director. And I'm also the Microsoft Go to Market Director at AvPoint. And joining me today on our all-star panel, we have uh, Dr. Sean McDonough, a consultant. <laughs> I know he's not a doctor. He's not a doctor by any My measure. wife's the only doctor in this place. Yeah. Hey, we got Neil. We'll admit, we'll admit Neil. Uh, but it, Sean is a consultant with Bitstream Foundry in Cincinnati, Ohio, and an Office Apps and Services MVP. We also have Mike Nelson, a solution architect with Pure Storage and a cloud and data center management MVP based in Appleton, Wisconsin. Hal Hostetler, a senior field engineer with Roland Shore and Tower in Tucson, Arizona, and an Office Apps and Services MVP. We also have Sherry Oswald, the Microsoft certified trainer, Microsoft Office master, and co-founder. There should be, again, sound effects with the master, <laughs> like master of the universe or, or like WWF or e wrestling or something. I'll work on that. <laughs> yeah. And co-founder of Power Up Learning in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And we were just joined by Microsoft Senior Program Manager, Dr. Neil Hodgkinson. Hello. Everybody. Taking your background. Morning. Yeah. But do, you, do you go by I'm doctor? Sure I like I always said that if I got my PhD, I would require my children to call me Dr. Buckley. But no, I don't. I don't. I only use the title when well, I have it on LinkedIn because that's you know when if I ever come to look for a new job I, <laughs> that's where I have it but other than that I, on, I only use the term doctor when someone irritates me or I have to write an official letter to like the government and say oh. yeah <laughs> is, is that kind of like when so you're in trouble and somebody uses your middle name that's, that's what I was thinking sure. <laughs> yeah kind of. that's right <laughs> yeah. uh, Michael by the way <laughs> yeah no. So, but I'm in, I'm, Sean, I'm in God mode today. Look. Oh, I see that. <laughs> God mode You've got Keith Ritchie's background on your uh, green screen. I know. Yeah. yeah. I'm being highways. Yeah. I, I actually have, Keith Ritchie actually wrote a song for me. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm on one of his albums. Yeah. And we did the, it was called Pillars of Time. Pillars. Yeah. There's like a. There's a Jeff Teeper song, there's a Neil Hodgkinson song, a Spence Hub song, a, a bunch of MVP, other MVPs. I don't know whether any of you guys are on there or not, but um, there's even a Bob Fox one. Yeah. Song. Wrote one for me too. Yeah. That's cool. I, I don't I don't believe he wrote one for me. I did reach out to him though and asked if he ever did anything that was more guitar driven on the ambient side, but that I could add drum beats and vocals to and do something. And he's like, nah, not, I was thinking of doing something that's more in the electronic dance music side of things and add beats to it. He's just like, yeah, we need to, he goes, I don't have anything that's like ready to go, but uh, I might go explore one of these days, his collection and find something and uh, add some, some layers to it. But uh, yeah, well, hey, okay. go, go ahead. I would say, yeah. Go a few of us in the internal key, like the internal folks at Dallas, we were fortunate enough to get a private screening of a short film that Keith wrote the score for on Saturday. So that was pretty cool. That was cool. So, um, yeah, we should look forward for that in the future. It's going to be well, festivals and things, but we'll see. 
Well, we are uh, underway with episode 51. So we had that uh, that brief hiatus there, eight episodes over on the App Point channel. Um, but the rest of it will will still. I need to go back and and get the recordings and do the blog post for it so that it's all in one place that you can go and find the collection. Are um, we calling it the App Point Affair? Uh, it's. <laughs> So they're still uh, sponsoring and we'll be probably doing some blog posts around uh, some of the questions that we answer. And so they'll go through and do, they've been getting great numbers off of the blog, just SEO of mm. people searching on the Q and A. Not surprising when you have a lot of traffic to your blog and people are looking for certain problems, like we are SEO rich in the transcripts of our discussions, whether we actually solve the problems or not. That's a different. <laughs> as long as we don't use the word telephony. As I, well, you just did, oh, yeah. there, Mike. So that's like we all need to add a telephony. Everybody drink take, telephony. Take there. <laughs> but um, episode 51, um, Let's kick things off with, I know there's a few things going on, Message Center updates, and then the other news of the day that we should kind of cover, but Mike, you want to kick us off? Yeah, I need a sound effect, though, Christian. I need that, you know, like the news sound effect, you know, the teletype going on. I can do that. I can get you some more code if you'd like it. All right, so what do we got going on? Microsoft Teams. Hey, who needs another view in Microsoft Teams? You got together mode, you got gallery mode, guess what? They're coming out with dynamic view. Oh it's my. a re redesigned and optimized meeting stage that will optimize your experience of consuming shared content and engaging with video and audio participants. Yeah. So now they'll be able to take like video and audio will be shown separately and then audio appearing as like little circles. And then the shared content is gonna appear larger with more participants being visible. So, you know, they're just, they're at basically adding another view that you can, uh, mm -hmm. you know, see in Teams. It, it, you know, that it's it's good to have that because it's almost like we were just talking before we got recording here, like using OBS and being able to go and set up your scenes. And there are a, a few default views that we all want to use for those things to have, you know, along the, the right side, all of the speakers, the presenters, People that are just attendees don't show up at all or down at the bottom as bubbles, you know, but you can have multiple speakers on the right side and the content on the main part of the screen to be able to kind of set those up and easily toggle between those views uh, is, uh, you know, much needed. Yeah, yeah I agree. I agree. Um, from the security side, uh, Microsoft, Microsoft Authenticator. So obviously everybody's supposed to be using MFA, right? Right? Everybody's using mm -hmm. MFA. I've heard of and that. Yeah, you've heard of that. <laughs> um, so MFA, everybody knows how it works. You basically, you go to a website, it gives you a code and it can give you a code a couple of different ways. You use the Authenticator app, you get an SMS message, blah, blah, blah. Um, now they're actually coming up with a new way to do it where you have to compare codes. So what's gonna happen is, is that you're gonna have an option where um, you'll pre be presented on the screen with three different codes and you have to match that code to the single number uh, or code that's in the Authenticator app. So the Authenticator app will give you one code and then you'll be given a choice of three on the screen and you just click on the one that is the code. They yep. have been, uh, we, we have they've been we have that already. premiering this. Absolutely well. Oop. Yeah. Hang on. Some months ago. Yeah, so lost, lost you're saying, what you said. <laughs> so you're saying that this has already been rolled out. I just got this message and it says it's not, it's rolling out early March and be complete by early April. So if you've gotten yeah, it, that's awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It depends what ring you're in. Yeah. Obviously, from a Microsoft standpoint, we have had this for a while. It's worked yeah. pretty well. well it works and, very yeah. well. The, the thing to note for administrators is that the default is off. Okay, so you'll be able to turn it on in, uh, you have to go to authentication methods late in the Azure portal or use the Graph API to turn it on. But by default, it's off. So maybe earlier rings, the default was on, uh, but for, um, you know, uh, regular users, it's gonna be default is off. Yeah, there's only one thing I think, that don't, I don't, I'm not sure whether I like it or not, because my, my concern and I've, 
I've flagged this, and I'm, I think I'm probably wrong. Um, obviously, the, the the notification comes to your logged in authenticator, mm -hmm. but it literally gives you, you know, choose one of three. Right? right. So if someone's compromised your device, they've got a one in three chance of actually getting yeah. past that. That's yeah. right. Not as opposed was, to putting like a six digit pin or something in. Yep. Yep. And that's always going to be, you know, uh, evolving. I bet you they go eventually. The, mm -hmm. You remember we used to have to do one security question. Then it was three security questions. Now, like my like my uh, some of my financial stuff, I've got to answer like six security questions. I mean, it's just crazy. Um, mm -hmm. So they just, you know, add on volume to, uh, you know, try and justify security. Anyways, moving on. Uh, there are updates to the meeting chat membership. Hey, hey, Hal, they've had yeah. an update for you. Yeah, so they're updating the participants' access to meeting chat, and the changes will manage a user's access to a meeting based on how they were invited to the meeting. So this is, uh, you know, when it's rolled out, um, it actually has a criteria of who can see and participate in chat. And that's for a single meeting or in a recurring meeting series. Um, so there's a list, there's there's actually a list uh, of criteria. Um, as an example, people who are invited to the meeting or forwarded the meeting invite, after it is scheduled, will have access to chat before, during, and after the meeting. Well, that would okay. be cool. Yeah, and people who are added to a meeting after it starts using the invite, um, you know, uh, what if they gave it to you and a participants pane or provided the meeting join invite in another way, they have access to the chat from the time they join to the time the meeting ends. So they can't see, you know, the, 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 the chat after the meeting or the chat that happened before them. They will not be able to see the chat takes place after the meeting ends. Is that, that actually came up in a session that I did this week uh, for the government. They were that was frustrated they're like we don't want them to see everything we've been doing somebody popped up in the middle of our training and said why am i in on this and they were getting bombarded by chat bubbles <laughs> so <laughs> yeah yeah is, is it possible to go in i mean you know, to to for the admin for the owner of that uh, meeting or that team to see um who's been invited what level access they almost need to have a view of that so you can see the people that don't have access or what controls and then be able to make changes okay that's yeah. my wish list there yeah. but be able if i see everybody that's been invited in and based on their permission level what they're restricted from but then if i can also go and toggle and manually change those that would be cool that'd be yeah. like a good custom view you know for admin to be able to create a custom yeah like video, you know, can they turn or their video? Can mm -hmm. they mute themselves? All yep. those settings that we have to do ahead of time. That's yeah. I can mute myself no matter where I am or what technology I'm using. <laughs> yeah, we know. Or unmute, unmute themselves is probably the word. I just choose not to use that feature. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody mutes Christian. Nobody. <laughs> All right. Um, Planner, uh, one of Christian's favorites. Uh, Planner is coming out with new roster containers. Did you, do you know about this, Christian? Do you know what a roster container is? I, I saw that. Uh, I didn't read in depth on it. Okay, so Planner is uh, their new type of container in Planner um, that allow plans to be created independent of a M365 group. So um, when the roster container is created, which is a simple, uh, it's just a simple list of members that are stored in Planner, that can contain any user with a valid AAD, uh, Azure Active Directory ID in the tenant, okay? So they're calling those plans contained by rosters as roster plans, um, which you know basically means that you can you can add anyone even though they're not part of that group. And it's it, the, ro the roster plans are no longer confined to a group. So why can't those be called personal plans or shared plans or something more intuitive roster plan i think is not really yeah you know user i don't know what it, it might have been it might have been personal sherry until Mar uh, microsoft marketing got a hold of it uh, <laughs> you know that's how it usually happened but, yeah. yeah well there's yeah. a lot of people have been asking for per personal plans for a long time yeah. um so it's going to be you know i don't need a whole group i just need to be able to manage my daily stuff so that's yeah. pretty cool yeah 
And uh, something that I think that Christian, uh, and Sean especially, uh, needs is that there's a new personal well-being insights coming to the to teams. Um, you know, this is going to kind of help you guys out a little bit. It helps give you balance, productivity, and well-being. <laughs> you know, <laughs> while you're using Teams, you'll be able to tap into breathing breaks, you know, and be able to send praise to collaborators, um, you know, pause and reflect anytime Whoa. during the workday, <laughs> as well as mindfully cl close out the workday with a virtual commute. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> oh, hey, wait a minute. What? A virtual commute? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, what Dare I, was... I ask, what is a <laughs> well, virtual commute? I don't know. <laughs> That's all well, the info the, that was given. I said, even even my walk down two flights of stairs to the basement office is technically a commute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you'll be able to think of it. You'll be able to, you know, breathing breaks. Just breathe. No, I do that now. Halfway down the stairs, I take about five minutes to get my, you know, my breath back from that effort, and then make it the rest of the way down the stairs. So, I do that now. Yeah. I used to joke that after I started working from home um, years ago, right, that my br my commute is brutal. Like dog cuts me off every morning and spills my coffee because <laughs> she used to yep. be, you know, she was that dog that had to be first. So she would just le stick the landing at the bottom of the steps and look at me like, I win. High <laughs> traffic mm. on the stairs. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm going to finish up here. Uh, I've got two more things. One is announcing conglomerate branding. Uh, anybody who doesn't know what that is, you've always been, if you ever wanted to create branding for your three, uh, M365, you always had to, you had one theme. That you could pick from or you had you know the only way you could do it is just to, to brand it so everyone sees the same thing well now you can have multiple themes based off of a m365 group so if you have a m365 group that is finance you could have its own theme um, and so on and so forth so it's not all just one theme anymore um, they're adding the ability to do alternate logos yep. uh, dark mode light mode you know colors all that kind of stuff I, I think that's great because, you know, look, that was a long time was a, a one of the major complaints about moving to Office 365 away from the on-prem was the ability to go in and personalize that environment. Mm -hmm. And there's a and we all know that that it is important to have a, you know, a, a space that is designed for that that team. But then again, to be forced to have the same design for the entire company, larger organizations, there's different branding and style guides for different business units. And so now to be able to go and do that is uh, pretty cool. Yeah, I think so. And uh, finally, um, let's take a pause in memoriam, okay? Um, <clears throat> Dynamics 365, uh, you know, the announcement is, is that they're getting rid of the Dynamics 365 link and the page uh, link off of M365. I think you see the writing on the wall, maybe. I'm not really sure, uh, but they're, that's going to disappear. So you won't be able to get to the 360, Dynamics 365 from M365 any longer. Um, and also, I knew this was going to happen. Uh, it just, you know, it was a matter of when uh, and delve. Anybody using Delve? Um, the Delve mobile apps are going away. And I think that is also another kind of precursor writing on the wall that, you know, uh, Delve might have might be on its last legs. Well, so, I mean, this has been a point of discussion for a long time. I just was looking to see if I have the Delve app in my Microsoft app graveyard folder on my <laughs> phone. <laughs> Um, is it there already? No, so I'll have to go and uh, and find it and add that. But the um, no is, is the fact that the Delve capability uh, it was almost like more of a. I mean, I get it. It's a landing page. I always kind of push back against that. I said I don't for want you. to go to a, so for a landing page for, me, for you, like, right? But I, I I wanted to have that experience within the many other workloads, and so that's what's been happening is that you have the the delve like um, personalized views like in, in the office apps so you can go in and see the shared with you the most recent kind of the intelligent filtering within each of the applications that came from the delve pack yeah well that yeah. comes up in sharepoint too 
I mean, you create it, you know, you go into SharePoint and right away it knows about your shared documents. If you're logging in your Office 365, it's, it knows about your Word documents, your Excel, all that kind of stuff. You know, kind of the same thing. Yeah. Well, so we heard about that about a year ago or, or longer. I don't know, time is a blur now. Um, but the talk about how, uh, you know, that that was the plan for Delve, that it was being integrated into the normal everyday experiences across the workloads. And so it, the, the fact that they're finally, if they are, getting rid of, I mean, just the app, is the desktop Delve app still going to be there or not? And mm -hmm. fade out, I, I don't, it's not that big of a deal for me because it's it's already being integrated in. Assimilate. I never complete. understood why I never understood why they had the uh, when you log into Office 365, you have that landing page, and then you have the Delve landing page. It yeah. should have been the same one. To me, it should have been directed right. to that main page because it's the same thing. Except, right. Yeah, that was I don't know why they overlooked that. It should have well, been. Well, that's it might have been adopted better had they actually surfaced it. People don't know it's, it's there. It's part of that ongoing joke of you know how many search locations do you have search experiences and there's like always been five or six or more and why do we need another search experience why not go add that capability into what we already have and so that's kind of what's happening yeah i think there's an element there christian that also you know think about the the the, the, the back end that's used for search these days it's evolved significantly from what we had back in the day so sometimes i think we just have to draw a line to the old version old approach yep and you know we've in, we've introduced the concept of microsoft search now which is predominantly graph based as opposed to the, what we think of back in the day those of us that well were, no disrespect to anybody but i think we're all old enough to remember how search indexes used to work in change sharepoint yeah. so um it's a it's a wholly changed evolved system now but to your point about you know how many locations do we need to search it doesn't make sense to add more locations versus update the location you already had to leverage the new technology. Except the teams building the new are different product teams than the ones that right. own other assets. So that's that's just the reality. But you know, sometimes mm -hmm. you know all the language around the one Microsoft. Let's go build this together. Would be to get those teams together, add the new features into the existing property, not create something that new. But but that's me. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I am done, but uh, well, Christian, if you want to segue in. Yeah. Do we want to talk about um, the, the news, the exchange, the the big uh, uh, security huge, thing huge going on news. here? Not I just know. news, but huge news. Um, bet so far, uh, the, what I read this morning, the latest numbers are 30,000 plus organizations that are affected by the zero day, the four zero day attacks um, that have been identified. Um, all four have to be executed in order to take the remote execution code um, to be able to do REC inside of the Exchange server. Um, but of course, this originated in uh, in uh, uh, China, and it's something that other uh, other hackers—I don't like to call them hackers, um, cyber terrorists, whatever they're calling them now—they're um, actually taking the lead, and they're they're. The, the the group out of China has given you know all the information. They put it out there and said, "Hey, hey everybody, this is how you do this." And now there are other you know pockets um, from within the U.S. and outside the U.S. that are now engaging and making this more of a widespread thing. When, so, when hacker groups are using Facebook ads to promote, yeah. then you know it's a bad thing. Yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah. that's kind of a joke. They're not. Not that I'm aware of or doing yeah, I don't know. I, I, that, but, yeah. <laughs> well, what I want to know is, Neil, you're you're Microsoft here. What did you know and when did you know it? <laughs> okay, so I have to be obviously have to be I can't say because I didn't I didn't I was told about it versus knowing about it, if that makes sense. I was told I didn't know about it until after it happened. Right. There was a couple of things that um I read an interesting thread. Uh Yesterday, actually, um, a tweet by um, the famous Snover, right? He posted about, hey, make sure your services are patched, make sure this, make sure that. This is an example why. And and also the, the follow up to that was, and why the hell are you running Exchange on premises anyway? 
right? And the whole debate about, well, <laughs> is, is on-premises more secure than cloud? You know, does it work for me? What All that kind of thing. And obviously, it then got into the next piece, which is, well, if I'm doing hybrid cloud and I'm doing hybrid identity, I, I at this point, I can't turn off an exchange server. I need at least one exchange server on-premises. Right. So I, I, I would have to pull the, the thread up to actually, you know, give the detail. Um, but it went into interesting things. So yeah, I'm, did, did I know about it before it happened? No, absolutely not. I did not. Our security teams are extremely protective of that information. And if they knew about it, they're not going to tell any of us yeah. until that, you know, not right. And, and it would be, it would, even if I, well, if I knew something that was like kind of secret inside the, the sausage factory, so to speak, <laughs> it wouldn't be, this is not the right form for me to say anything about that. Yeah. But yeah, I'll, just, I'll, I will tell you, I did not know anything. Yeah. Yeah. Just to be fair, I mean, the first, the first indication of this attack was back in January, right? So the first actual zero day happened January 21st or something like that. Um, so this is something they've been working on for a while. And I think the first patch came out the second day of March. Um, but Microsoft has actually uh, has written um, in uh, the ZDNet article, one of the ZDNet articles was that um, they will not either confirm nor deny um, that this was part of the, <laughs> as part of SolarWinds, as part of the SolarWinds issue. Oh. So they, they're like, you know, there's no yes or no answer there coming from Microsoft. So, yeah, it is interesting though to understand how an external entity can. Why are you publishing Exchange to the accessible to the internet? Why are you even doing that? I think we've got uh, one of the questions later um, where it's kind of goes out. Uh, you know, the, from the uh, you know public facing website perspective i know it's not exactly the same thing but again like is microsoft out of that business so there's kind of a question around that where we might resurface this topic well why don't we uh why don't we jump into the questions and i know uh at neil i don't know if you saw in the email uh that the homework if you had any update on the full fidelity migrations or we can hold that yeah. till time we can i can do but i haven't managed to do a test um, but I can report back based on, as okay. I mentioned last time, I've, I've been out of migrations for a while. Well, let me, uh, let me let me post the question. The question that was asked uh, previously, does anyone use the SharePoint migration tool from Microsoft to move large amounts of content from SharePoint 2010 to SharePoint Online? Any issues encountered? Uh, we're going to pilot this soon. And so you were looking into, you're moving content versus the full fidelity migrations with the structure and... Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So if you look at the the content, the content moves without without issues. The structure of the migration in terms of site structure, site templates, workflows, workflows was my primary thing I mentioned last time. Then right now, including even things like signature workflows and site level workflows, list level workflows. Um, so they do move. The um, the one thing I would say, if someone's planning on moving a significant amount of content. Don't try and do it with one instance of the tool. Use multiple instances of the tool to gain the performance level. And aka.ms um, slash SPMT has a pretty good article about how to get the best performance from the tool. So when we can pack it there. If there's a follow-up question, we can we can take it again. And when you say and they move workflows, I mean, there was a, again, this is, you know, a couple of years out of date, my knowledge of it, but there was still a problem with moving uh, in-state uh, workflows. So if you were halfway through, it would move the, the workflows, but you would have to essentially um, restart them. I mean, it couldn't move something that had yeah. 10 steps and it's halfway through. Have they right. figured out how to do, has anybody figured out how to do the in-state workflow movement? I, I don't believe so. No, I mean, yeah. that's still a. We'll, we'll we'll move the workflow definition, and attach it to the right place, and essentially republish it. But it won't get as far as I know. You know, if you're midway through a state machine, you're you're kind of busted. Yep. So that's just a big FYI, folks, on migrations. All right, uh, thank you for that. And uh, so let's jump into community questions, into question number one. Uh, John asks, um, I upgraded from Office 2010 to Office 365. 
everything upgraded just fine, or it seemed, except my calendar. I can see on the right-hand side where there's appointments, it's over in the task view, but I can't see the items on the calendar. I could use some help in trying to fix this. So is anybody- I uh, sprinkled over this when I saw this. Uh, make sure, yeah, I guess I'm speaking. Okay. You are speaking. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, I thought I had I had the microphone turned off there for a little while, uh, and it kind of puzzled me as to what exactly he's seeing. Um, first of all, he doesn't specify whether he's using the desktop client or whether he's using Outlook Web Access, and people tend to want to make these work interchangeably, and of course, they're quite quite different. Uh, the closest I was able to come up with this is uh, once again a view setting, and uh, my suspicions are he's over in the calendar. Um, and uh, if he goes up to his uh, little view tab up on top, he's going to and hits change view. He's going to find something like list or arc or active or preview. Although I don't suspect preview so much because that still shows the calendar and doesn't have his calendar selected. That, that's uh, about the closest I can come to that one. That's the only thing I know of that will produce a list on the right hand side and not show you much of a calendar anywhere else. Yeah, because the date is there, obviously, if it's showing up in the task pane. And, and I'm I'm with you, Hal. I'm assuming that it's desktop version, but uh, well, the other mistake could be that he's got the tasks open, but he might be in the wrong calendar view on the left side. And so I run to this if you have multiple profiles, like just the the other day, the, a few days ago, where I was, uh, you know, I had my desktop client up and open, and I'm like, why aren't any of these items up? And it's my Christian Buckley calendar. It's like, oh, it's on the wrong profile. Uh, and so I went and clicked on the other Christian Buckley profile. There's the entire calendar up. So it was the, I think I had it for some reason, closed down the wrong one. It was the uh, the the uh, community tenant that I had open. And so it just shows up the same way, you know, Christian Buckley. Um, and uh, and so that, I, you know, you're able to see all the tasks for all your profile that's, you know, but you're, you're seeing the wrong calendar in screen. That could be another... Indeed. Issue. Okay. Any, anybody else there? Any other ideas? Okay. Market is solved. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll <laughs> John comes back with other. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Just Deep says, uh, question number two. Hi, I've been playing around with the various task management apps in 365, but struggling to find one that ticks all the boxes. Could somebody kindly point me in the right direction, please? I'd like, and this is for those, this is one of those questions where they're outlining stuff and what they're try, really doing is like you're you're venturing into paid consultant time to help you <laughs> set up your environment. Um, but, you know, wanted to get some feedback here on this. So, uh, you know, tasks that can be viewed and assigned to the team. So four people, um, having a field for client name, having a field for nature of task, uh, and then general freeform box for description. And 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 so look, you can add in, um, you know, the freeform box, I mean, there's, you saw some comments uh, around this, like, you know, hey, you could use planner, or what are you really trying to do with this kind of tracking, go build a list, um, it, it, you know, use the list capability, which can go and do all this tracking, um, and any other thoughts? Those were the same ones I had and, you know, you know, start with the task list and then build the fields that you want. Um, I put a couple of links in the chat there for you, but it depends on whether they're in server or if they're on prem, they didn't really mention which version they're in. So, uh, depending on which one, but Microsoft list is not on prem yet. So. And I mean, <clears throat> Microsoft List is, it, <clears throat> excuse me, it can be a very, it, it, you know, extensive. You know, you can add all those fields and things like that. So it's not something yeah. that just, you know, only does shopping lists. If people, you know, people, some people think it just does like really basic stuff, but no, it, it goes well beyond that. Mm -hmm. well, it does indicate the, 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 the question that's 365. Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say, you know, one of the uh, you know, standard templates is 
a project management is is, is kind of tracking less as well. So it's a, it's a common scenario, but you can then go in and customize exactly what you can go and do. Well, they've been talking about adding custom fields to Planner for what over a year, year and a half. And it's they on, haven't yeah. done it yet, which, yeah. you know, if they want us to use those, then they need to make it more flexible. Um, so says, planner isn't an option. In progress mm -hmm. on the roadmap for planner. I don't know. It's been in progress for eight months. <laughs> there, <but laughs> uh, longer than that, they talked about it at a SharePoint conference a year and a half ago. <laughs> as we've been talking yeah. about, it's, you know, the website says coming soon with a little construction worker animation yeah, yeah. Coming, <laughs> coming for Christmas, Christmas 2018. So yeah. soon and, is and probably relative, extreme, right? <laughs> probably extreme overkill, but I mean, if it's if it's so critical, then I mean, and you know, forgive me for saying this, but Azure DevOps is another option, right? It seems yep. like that'll be overkill. Um, You're forgiven. Powerful a tool, but it <laughs> it would certainly perform the the requirements. It it you're using you're using basically a, a Cadillac to do the work of a Pinto. At that point, yes. Um, you know. <laughs> yeah. I'm using a pile driver to knock a small nail yeah. into a piece of wood. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It'll do the job, though. It will. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm hearing the Tim Taylor oh, 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 in my head right there. <laughs> yes. Because right. we can. Yeah. It's uh, let's see. Question number three. Tiger says, uh, "I'm looking to convert our sites to modern." I believe the best approach is to start a new site, which is fine, except I need to move all of our documents, two terabytes, from an old library to a new library. Is the move function adequate for this? This is kind of that, that like the homework item, Neil. I know there is a 100 gigabyte limit, so I'd have to move at a subfolder level. I looked at mover, but you can't have the same connector for source and destination. This is true. I mean, and the move option. Um, so it's it's obviously it's obviously online. It's converting sites to sites. Uh, I'm assuming online anyway. That would make sense. Um, there is a uh, a good article actually. I, I pulled this article up earlier when I was looking through the questions, which tells you how to convert your sites to modern. I'll pop that in the chat window. Ooh. It's not, not something I really do much anymore. Um, I haven't done recently, so I'd have to do some research. Oh, shoot. I said the wrong question. I said the wrong word. <laughs> do some research. <laughs> but uh, there's, the article which should, should give you everything. The, and the, biggest, the biggest issue I find with the move function is it's just like he indicates in the question it's slow. And the quantity of stuff you can move is not huge in one particular batch. Well, and if you have one it site, that, that shouldn't be a stretch. But if you've got 20 sites, that's a big effort. Mm -hmm. right? and yep. And then does it maintain the metadata when you move it? Does it maintain the last time it was edited or mod or saved or who created it? Or is it, I don't know, I'm asking in mm -hmm. um, when you use the move function? And I realize people want to do as much as possible with the platform within the platform without going external, but there are partner solutions that that do all this yeah, and yeah. can do it much faster and more comprehensively. And going back to that full fidelity migration question, third party solutions are, you know, more able to do that than you tend to get what you pay for. So yep. if you want to do it on the cheap, you might have to battle with it a bit and make some compromises. Yeah. Yep. Your, your, your cost element's going to be time and resources. The, this is the cost of licensing and tool. Exacto mundo. Yep. All right, let's uh, jump to question number four. Uh, Leonard asked, uh, so this is not technically a Microsoft 365 question, I've tried multiple times to get my bookmarks from the new Edge uh, to sync to Edge on my iPad with no success. Well, the first problem is you're using an iPad. No, uh, I have searched for solutions and 
tried the ones suggested to no avail. I have signed on with my ID both on Edge copies. Oddly enough, iCloud will sync Edge bookmarks to Safari, but alphabetizes them instead of leaving them as on my Windows laptop. Wow, imagine that. Apple and Microsoft just not communicating well. I'm shocked. Ooh, yes. I, I'm stunned, yeah. I don't think the problem is technical there. It's just implementation. That's my guess, but I'm going but it wouldn't it be. I mean, if you're logged in the same profile in two edge browsers and it should recognize you and sync between the two of them. So, the, I mean, what if you've got the latest version of edge for each of those devices and you're logged in the right way, it should pick them up. I mean, the I, you know, I, I don't have the ability to go test this out um, but I mean, is is Apple doing something to stop that from happening? Yeah, I can't test it out either. The closest I can I can bring up is I've got Edge on my Android phone, and that that synchronization does work. Yep, I have it on my iPhone, which works fine. I don't have a fruit device either, so I have nothing Apple, so. Just say yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is one where it's like it, we can't even assign to homework. We just have to um, we have to say, Leonard, um, I don't know the answer, but I admire the question. So thank you. Go to the genius bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had a, I had an iPad at one point and I it was a toy, not a tool for me at that point. Yeah. And uh, I, I stumped the guys at the Genius Bar asking basic questions. And after that, I'm like, I'm never buying it. If this is their geniuses, I'm not buying any more Apple. So, yeah. but. Yeah, that's that's weird. Right. So, all right. I'm, no. I'm just installing Edge on my iPad, on my iPhone right now and syncing with my Microsoft account. So we'll see what happens. All right. We'll come so, back. Get, provide us an update. We'll we'll jump into question number five, but we might we might come back to you, Leonard. Uh, so Marcos says, question number five, hello. I would be very grateful to count with any help. I have been using Gmail since 2004. Now mm -hmm. that I have a subscription for Microsoft 365, I'm trying to set up Outlook, but the software is delayed a lot. Online. Yeah. <laughs> and many times I see my inbox Sorry. on Outlook different than the one I have at Gmail web interface, so Outlook with fewer messages. What's the problem, please? Also, it seems Outlook never stops to sync. Thanks in advance for your help. Well, once again, are we talking desktop? Are we talking Outlook Web Access? To the best of my knowledge, Gmail does not have any kind of an interface that looks like Outlook. They have their own. So uh, Gmail Web Interface sounds to me like Outlook Web Interface or Outlook Web Access, and in which case, yeah, you're going to see fewer things because they're different. Uh, Never stops to sync. Well, okay. Once again, OWA doesn't need to sync because it's already there. If you're talking Outlook Desktop, uh, you, how, you, it may have already synced and you don't note it. <laughs> um, so, so I don't know. It's, it's another one of those that this depends, and we could use a little bit more information on that. And Sherry, you had a link there. Yeah, I put a link in the chat about um, customizing your sync settings because if it's constantly syncing, you can actually uh, control that a little bit better. Also, how far back, and it might be the settings on their OST file. So um, that could be an answer. Again, to Hal's point, like what version are you using? We don't know. Yeah. And are they syncing their Gmail box or are they actually using Outlook? That's yeah, I'm the other. Yeah, confused thing. about that as well. Yeah. It's, you know, it, whether you can. Yeah, they're yeah. syncing. Yeah. yeah, you can bring any you can bring Gmail and Outlook and manage your. I used to do that all the time. So, well, and, of course, and if you do it on the web, then you're talking about a connected service, and that behaves quite a bit differently than just stuffing a Gmail account in Outlook Desktop. Right. True that. And bandwidth. It's always the question exactly. now, right? What's their bandwidth? But, right. and how long did he post this question? It was he could it have still been processing? Is trying to pull up the backlog? Um, do, does he have other filters that's turned on that it's not showing everything up? I mean, if he's going and again, if it's a Gmail, that's kind of how I read it, that this was, he was trying to sync his Gmail through Outlook 
and is not seeing all the same messages in the Outlook Gmail folder than he is through Gmail. And could be filters, it could be just the, the syncing, the time frame and well, I have a I have a Gmail account. When I go log in a Gmail, I can't find this stuff that I see readily in Outlook. So they do show things differently. They don't have the same like little filtered view like this is an ad or this is a you know, you can promotion or whatever. I don't I don't usually go to the web client, I usually use Outlook. Yeah. Yeah, Gmail is also a uh, a root folder animal, and if you don't have the inbox specified as the root folder, then then the then the folder tree that you see is bizarre, and it may be there and you're just not seeing it or looking in the right place. Yep. All right. Hey, Neil, any update to uh, the syncing of the Edge browsers? Um, it's interesting. It's Looks like it's updated some of my previously um, like favorites. You know, like we get like the popular icons. Like I've got LinkedIn's popped up, the Netflix has popped up, Facebook's popped up, but I'm not seeing anything actually syncing in my in my what would be my favorites. If that makes sense. My favorites, all my and my history is only showing what looks like it's pulled the history of sites from my Safari browser on the mobile, but not pulled them from my, what would be my regular history or browsers favorites on the my laptop. So, so could just be that it's not synced yet. At least I just literally just installed it. Well, I'll check it again later, but a few things look like they've come through, but I wouldn't say it's in any way fidelity. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and do we chalk this up to the fact that they're just um, in two operating systems? It's a slightly different product, and so it's just designed slightly differently. I mean, there was, I mean, it used to be there was a full-fledged, you know, Mac business unit, the MacBoo, uh, inside of Microsoft, and people would complain all the time that you know, it, it, an Office being one of the the uh, top downloads on uh, you know Apple devices. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, but they were, it was a different flavor of the software and they were usually, uh, you know, a year or two or more behind in feature set uh, windows between uh, uh, iOS. So, um, you know, is it just a different version of the software and just acts differently? Uh, like, I, I don't know. Who, who knows? Who knows these things? <laughs> All right, uh, let's jump to question number six. Uh, Karthikeyan says, uh, is it possible to get Azure AD users custom extension properties using Microsoft Graph API? If the graph is not returned, how to get the Azure AD custom properties or extension attributes? Looking for recommendations. We need to get the properties and display it into uh, based on the user search. We may have 10 to 12 custom properties in the AAD. I just dropped the link in chat on yeah. directory schema extensions for um, graph that you can use to extend Azure AD. Yeah. And I, I put one in before that, um, that actually is a conversation between MVPs about it. Uh, so yeah, there's definitely, you got to remember though, there's two different APIs. There's Azure, AD graph, and there's the graph API. Azure AD graph is going away. That's being deprecated. Um, graph API is going to take over everything. I mean, that's that's going to be the 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 go to for everything in Azure. So um, there's a difference between the two, definitely. Okay. Uh, question number seven. Oh, here's what I was talking about earlier. Julie asks, uh, I have a bit of a random question for you guys and gals. We are currently on-prem, but moving to online over the next 12 to 18 months. And on one of our training sessions, I asked a question about anonymous access to a 365 site. I was told that SharePoint does not support web-facing sites anymore. Does this mean it's just no good at it, or does it literally mean that you can no longer build a site or a power app solution and share it via the internet with anonymous users. They're just not good at it. That's what it is. It's just not good. <laughs> they can't it share wasn't it. Wasn't considered an appropriate investment vector. <laughs> yeah, I've well, got a 
bunch of blog posts I wrote back before they sunset them, and I had to migrate a lot of different small businesses off of uh, um, SharePoint online public sites. So, yeah, Microsoft backed out, decided it wasn't a, a strategic area they wanted to invest in. So, no, you're not going to be able to get your anonymous, anonymous users into uh, your SharePoint site, sadly. It was so four years ago. <laughs> it was quite some time ago, yeah. It was a while. Yeah, <laughs> I put yeah. a, I put the article in the chat if somebody wants I've to. I've got a link to there. It. Yeah, Sean, do you have an article of yours that I can post to to the link as well? If you could grab one, I'll I'll uh, and put it in the chat and I'll add it to the uh, blog post. Sure, I'm happy to do that. <laughs> the yep. in the in memoriam for those. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Um, let's see. Oh, another question from Marcos, um, says, Hey guys, what are your suggestions for someone who is coming from LibreOffice uh, client and some tools from SoftMaker to learn quick Microsoft 365? I subscribed yesterday and I am now trying to learn the things. So somebody coming over, you know, there are so many great training resources that are out there now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so depending on what you are trying to learn, I mean, is it broadly across, you know, I mean, a along every workload, there are tools in videos. Honestly, when I have a question about any product, whether it's in the Microsoft ecosystem or fixing something in my car or what cooking something, I go to YouTube first and there's so much great content <laughs> and walkthroughs of everything um, that, that you could possibly want to know. But I would start with uh, the docs.microsoft. Uh, That's going to be my practice. suggestion. Yep. I could do a shameless plug being a Microsoft you certified trainer. Please you do. Should. I know. Yes. I've got Absolutely. a great on demand learning tool if people want it. It's a little more structured, but. Um, this one, I refer this to everyone who starts with Office 365, and that's the office.com slash training. Um, it redirects to a different URL that I posted there in the chat. But it's a good start. If you're brand new to it especially, it's not going to put me out of work yet, but it's the resources <laughs> there are really good. <laughs> yet? Yes. Yet. Yeah. One other thing to note, um, if anybody else is coming from LibreOffice, you can actually make uh, LibreOffice look like Office 365. Okay, you can't make Office 365 look like Libre, Libre, I mean, by default. But if they still have that capability to access that, they can actually make the two look, you know, so they know what to do when they get over to 365. So. Excellent. Yeah. Somebody spent time building that capability. They did, they did, and it's free. Uh, it's a free download. It just basically puts the ribbon bar up there. It does all that kind of stuff. Woohoo! Excellent. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Number nine, Justice asks, uh, I have a lot of information on Teams now. I just realized if I delete it by accident, everything will be gone. Is there a way to back up all the channels? Why would you want to back up the channels? Office 365 team back set up for you. You can just raise a support request for a restore. There, there are tools out there, though, that do do backups. Might come to some sort of uh, Yeah, it's going to be piecemeal, though, You're, because the data resides in different places. So, you know, <coughs> Exchange, SharePoint Online, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a solution that covers your Microsoft 365, stores and you want to try and back it up you can go ahead and do that but you're going to be piecing things together mm -hmm. yeah you have to understand that that's this is a you know, kind of day one question that was asked about teams it it's not like you are when you delete a team and it asks you you know are you sure that you want to do this because what you're doing is you're deleting everything that's associated with everything that's connected with it, all the chat that's part of that, all the content, the documents um, that have been added to that, and all of the permissions around those things, like you're removing all of that. Groups, yeah. Yep, and and so it's, it's not as simple as just, hey, I just deleted a site. 
and hey, what's the 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 backup for this? But you you do have the assets for each of those things, and your organization might have a you know a, a recovery retention recovery process around all of that. Um, so you know, one I would start there if your organization has oh. something that they're already doing over and above. Hal, did something happen, or did you not like my answer? <laughs> He's frozen. Well, that might be why he was sad there for a second. <laughs> um, as he was losing his connection. Um, but oh, there he's back. Hey, Hal. Back. But um, so that back. might be the first place to go and 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 check. Um, and then uh, then beyond that would be you know, hey, to Microsoft. Um, you know, hey, is this something that you can go and reinstate this? All right. That was you? No, that was Hal. Oh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, I think he may not have had the connection back entirely. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Any other guidance on on that? Because to say deleted by accident, I mean, it's they make it very difficult. There are multiple steps to happen in that accident of a deletion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of yeah, like a. And what what was deleted? You know, what, it, like you say, what, did they delete a channel? Did they delete the whole team? So there's what no recycle bin. Deleted? <laughs> there's no well, recycle bin on this stuff. And seriously, how many times you need to be asked? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you really, really sure? When you still call that an accident, right? Well, there, <laughs> you know, Mike, there is around the individual, the content, each of the containers. Um. Which if, you delete, is why if, you, if you delete a channel, you're telling me there's no recycle bin that you can bring that channel back. I don't think so. I, I, I think it it's hard, how hard, you for, it. hard for me to believe that. Yeah, I mean, if you're just in Teams and you right click and you, you know, say delete or remove channel or whatever it is, it's hard for me to believe who Microsoft, who has recycle bin everything now, um, would not have that ability. It just says, you know, yeah well yeah it is an orchestration whenever you provision or tear down something so huh? just seems like it's something that you know i, th I thought they would have by default it would be because <clears throat> you delete anything a resource you know in azure and things like that it doesn't just go away yeah okay. there's <laughs> there, there is the restore capability. I was looking for the article for it. So I've got one because so, you can go in. Because if, if, if the problem is that you're trying to go in and you want to remove permissions and archive something, there's a process. There's the ability to go in and archive that. And then, of course, do that. that's where you're removing access to those assets and removing permissions, but you want to retain all the content versus delete it outright. And there is a, a process to uh, restore a deleted uh, group and uh, a deleted team. So uh, I've got the link here. I'll post it into chat, which I know is great for visibility here, but I'll, I'll have it in the blog post as well. So yes, Mike, there is that process. You don't have to be angered of something, you know, that uh, we just lose Mike. That seems so. Yep. Oh, okay. He was so fed up. He was so disgusted with the fact that he thought you couldn't restore a deleted team. He just left. He stormed he off. He rage quit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like he had to, he had to depart early anyway. Uh, so that's probably what happened there. He probably lost sight of time and needed to jump. All right, uh, question number 10, Carol asks, is anyone else having issues creating a Microsoft list from Excel? I formatted it as a table, have no blank rows and no dates. I've created new workbooks, formatted them all as text, tried creating from an upload, from OneDrive, from an Excel stored in the doc library on the same site. I'm getting an error. Sorry, something went wrong, no matter what I try. 
It's happening in two completely separate tenants, and I'm pretty frustrated. The only solution I could find that I could make work was to create a list by importing a spreadsheet to an on-prem environment using IE, yuck, and copying the results list to the tenant using third-party solution. <laughs> yeah, I'm confused by that. Uh, yeah. That oh, we lost... And Neil, in disgust, stormed off as well. <laughs> <laughs> I had something going on. Well, I've done this often, actually. Right now, I'm um, working on a project where we're doing Microsoft Forms using the quiz, and Power Apps does not post the the uh, score from the quiz yet. You, there's no way to capture that. If you guys know how to do that, I would love to hear how you fix that. But I'm having to export it from Excel and paste it into a list manually. And it works just fine. The only thing I can think of is it's the data types that don't match um, or or the field orders don't match, whatever columns they're using. There's something off about that. But otherwise, I'm doing this all the time. So I'd almost want to talk to Carol and find out how she's trying or who was that, Julie? So the difference yeah. between whether it's yeah, uh, creating it, just so I'm confused, um, is it you know, creating it from scratch or importing data into an existing one? Because the having the mismatched um, data types or columns, I mean, that would make sense in importing into an existing. But right. if I was creating a list, uh, you know, from scratch. Well, I'm wondering if it's if she just should remove the table formatting and just do it as plain text and copy mm -hmm. and paste that in. It might be a better option because maybe when she's formatting it as a table it's recognizing something um hmm. as far as the data types and not happy about it i'm not sure or you know if it's you know a text field only has a limit of 255 characters so if there's some of the something in there is longer than that then it's going to error out because it doesn't meet the criteria for the destination list yeah but yeah i do this all the time so i'm not sure i almost want to say carol cool me <laughs> Because these are the things I take personally. Like, why isn't it working? So, but yeah, and um, she said she's using ShareGate too. So she's tried it with that as well. But I'm not sure. Yeah. So it's uh, this is one of those scenarios where I think we can sit here and speculate, but I think it needs to be a conversation and understand a little more about what she's doing. So it's not even a, it's not a homework item. Yeah. Yeah. Like help us help you, Carol. Too obscure. <laughs> yeah. Email me at shortcutsherry.com and see if I can help her. So yeah, those are good. Should clarify that when you're saying that. It's like email me, me. M E at <laughs> that, that uh, kind of stuck. It's it's easy to remember because nobody can spell my name correctly, but and then they'd have to spell it twice correctly. So if I did Sherry at shortcutsherry.com. See, I know that now when I'm emailing you and I type me and I get two. I get uh I get you and Erica Tully as well has one. Yeah. So. <laughs> I noticed she did the same thing. It's awesome. Yeah. Like yep. just email me. <laughs> <laughs> Which me at shortcutsherry.com. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, let's see. Uh, question number 11. Um, Carthy says, is there a way to copy all the Teams chat history to OneNote or OneDrive while using Teams exploratory license, which I believe means the free license? I was just looking that up because I know in my tenant, they're like, you're eligible for the exploratory license. I had no idea what that meant, so I had to go look it up. But um, basically, if they don't have a license for teams, they can participate in the meetings. But does anybody have a way of testing to see if they can capture the check other than highlighting it all Cop and copying and yeah. pasting? Yeah. No, so. I don't. That, see, there was a bit of a discussion about that during during Ignite, one of the sessions. And uh, uh, as, as I recall, there is nothing built in that will let you do that. You can copy and paste as you suggest. Yeah. Yeah, they have a send to Outlook or save to or share to Outlook button in some of the chat, but it's not the entire history. It's just one, no, yeah, you know, one message or one thread. Yeah. Um, but it would be nice to have that. Just kind of like Outlook, it you would. can send to one note. You know, it'd be nice to be able to capture all that because eventually chat goes away, and you, um, yep. for a lot of organizations, actually, especially the government, there, I think some of the agencies are 
limiting to 90 days of history or 30 days of history. So they, it all gets deleted. And if you want to have that for reference later, OneNote's your best option. So, yep. Well, even if it, you had kind of an easy way to export to another Microsoft product like Notepad, you know, just <laughs> only export to Notepad or something. But if you had something just simple like that, but I get it. It's like, look, if you want the richer features, which includes exporting or saving the the, the chat files, then you, you got to pay for the license. Right. Well, and I was just going to, I was looking to see if anything was on user voice to have people vote that up because I think it would be a feature that'd be useful for yeah. many different um, use cases. So. Yeah, you look at something like that, though, it's like, yeah, it'd be nice, but then it's a free version. So it's not something that's driving dollars for Microsoft yeah. to go and do it. So it'd be a low to no pry, you know, request. Yeah. Taking out the the exploratory license, so I, to, in my mind, that would be a feature that would be helpful, regardless of what version they're using. But it's yeah. not available in any version, so. Yeah. All right. Uh, question number twelve. Athena asked, "Is there any way to make certain views not able to be seen based on SharePoint Group or other within SharePoint Online? Uh, no third-party options, please. However, I'm open to low-code." solutions so it's we see a variant of this question of you know quite a bit in fact i think our last couple episodes we had a version of this uh question of restricting views or access to a, a, a view you know there's been a like can i you know, we, we've talked about restricting view per uh, per per item, people can only see their own entry, their own item that they're adding to a list. Yeah, you can default. I mean, there are ways to, depending on you know the specific situation, there are a couple different options. I mean, the different queries that will pull data back can be uh, written to center on yourself so that you pull back what you have control or have authored. Um, SharePoint audiences are another way to uh, segment what people see, but they are not a security mechanism. So, um, you know, search queries, uh, if we're talking content search web part, uh, that can also be used uh, with the query builder is very effective at building uh, uh, different search queries that will drive output based on how you want to partition it. So there are several different ways to do this. It just depends on the specific situation. Yeah, I, I use pages and create different views on pages and secure the pages, but that doesn't prevent people from going to the source list if they're savvy enough. Um, there's third party right. tools that do that. And to her point, she doesn't want a third party tool, but welcome to my world. I've been using SharePoint for 20 years and we've been asking for secured views for a long time. Um, the only other thing you can do is sometimes split the list so that you have a look up to another list and then recombine it in a view that people can't see. But it, yeah, there's no good workaround to that at all, um, except making the only public view a me view and uh, don't allow people to create their own views, then that's a possibility, but it still doesn't um, prevent them from getting into the back end of the list if they can see the list at all. Uh, all right, uh, question 13. Michael asks, uh, hello all, I just installed SharePoint 2016 and I'm trying to run PowerShell commands and I'm getting errors running the P-S-S-N-A-P-I-N. P-S snap-in. Yes. Uh, they haven't been it says saying that running the PS snap and they haven't been registered. How do I register them, please? Uh, when you install SharePoint, if you're on a farm member server, um, go to your start menu and open up the SharePoint uh, PowerShell uh, console window, basically. That'll auto that in that window the the necessary snap-ins are registered. Um, if you're just trying to do it with a generic PowerShell snap-in window, 
that's probably where you're running into problems and in which point, you know, you, you can easily import them. But Microsoft does drop a nice little shortcut in the SharePoint um, start menu folder for SharePoint PowerShell. And that'll give you quick access to those uh, commandlets that you're trying to get to. Neil, oh. you're uh, muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Oh, you can just run the add hyphen PS snap in. Um, or what is it? There's a shortcut, NSP. Um, and you can just let you do, you can really change. Just do like star SH star, and it'll just bring the SharePoint ones in. OSP star, it'll just bring the SharePoint ones in for you. It's a bit cheating, but it works. Yeah. So if this Lazy, guy, but it works. <laughs> is if, if this guy's having trouble getting the snap in uh, and the commandlets to show up, he might not even be. Uh, he might not have a remote sign policy set up and whatnot. Well, so yeah, it would it would tell you that though. I mean, um, or should the yeah. PS snap in? So lazy. It works. Yeah handful of different ways to do it. Real quick. And make sure you do it with a uh, an administrator prompt. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's all you need to do. That sh should work. There's a number of things you can do. There's a number of switches you can do there as well, like for verify and confirm and all that kind of stuff. And you know, don't error out if it's already added. All those kind of things are there. It's been it's just been a while since I've done it. Yeah. Neil's got gotcha, you, Michael. All right. Uh, let's see here. Oh, hey, this is another one where the question was written in a way that. Uh, I, I was excited to uh, to read through. There's actually three questions here, but Matthew uh, says to come on, let me get get that out of the way. Oh, I hate when that happens. Oh, this, is the, this is the Kylie Minogue question. Right? <laughs> yes, uh, to quote the great Kylie Minogue, "I'm spinning around still. Yep, I'm still going around in circles trying to get the required privileges." So can somebody clarify if I understand this correctly? So three questions here. One, is a group site basically a supercharged team site based on a team's template? Sherry has put a great post in the chat window for this one. I think for the whole piece. Yeah, the, the, the standard demystification of groups versus teams. <laughs> Whenever you create a team, you create a group. But when you create a group, you don't necessarily create a team. So the teams is that layer of collaboration on top of the foundation that includes the Active Directory group, the um, email account, the SharePoint site. Um, so no, it's kind of back the opposite would be my answer on that one. Is it basically a supercharged team site? Anybody else agree with me or want to add to that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I put the. I agree with you. There's a, there's a great article there yeah. um, that tries to explain it, and of course, pictures always good. So there's a picture, kind of a graphic in there, and what they're at. I like pictures. Me <laughs> <laughs> <B2>. too. <laughs> and, and then, like then he starts talking like about. Crayons. <laughs> <laughs> That's my speed too, Neil. <laughs> so, do we want to go to? Part there was two, a, bullet there was two. A, there was a cutting remark that I thought I was so clever when I was about 15 years old, and somebody had asked repeatedly, a, like, just a dumb question, and I responded, shut out to them, was, uh, like, do you need me to write it in crayon for you? And I just, uh, and I realized, uh, and I was I was in a, in a class, and it was a college class, and I felt like such an ass afterwards. Uh, I think it was to the TA or possibly the teacher that I was responding. So, so, so you weren't making friends on that day, I'm guessing. Not that day. Probably no, not. No, I was not. <laughs> yeah. I had repeated myself several times 
And uh, yeah, I felt bad afterwards. I'm, I'm uh, sure you were like, that sounded better when it was in my head. <laughs> not satisfactory and in it play was the, with yeah, others. <laughs> it was the, should have been the internal voice, not the external voice, but yeah, so. Uh, yeah, so the second part of the question, Sherry, to, to your point is like, if I start at the tenant's parent level with a team site or group site, can I only then create subsites based on the ugly team's template? Uh, that's a, a yes, but the um, you know Microsoft is not really encouraging the use of subsites anymore. So the 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 better structure is to create a modern site as a hub, and then additional sites for the you know the sub site that he would create. But I still feel there are po there are reasons to have subsites sure. because I use managed metadata and content types and. So yes, but you can add modern pages to the ugly team site template and make it not be quite so ugly. So doesn't mean you don't have the modern capabilities, just the the templates that are there. And again, is he in is he on prem or is he in the cloud? So I'm assuming Well teams it would assume cloud. The cloud, yeah, I'm guessing. So but he wasn't but in, if somebody else has that situation and they don't they weren't actually talking about teams, but yeah. Yeah, and we're not talking about the I, I teams, know. the ugly teams template as in Microsoft Teams. We're talking about the teams collaboration SharePoint template, <laughs> right? Yeah. Thank you for that, Sherry. That's where I was going to go. Um, <laughs> I know I just had to step away for a second, so I didn't know whether you got to this point, but the teams, you know, the concept of the teams site collection path, right? The, the, the path, you know, we have like slash site slash teams. I think sometimes people confuse the two, or they certainly confuse when it says slash teams. They assume they're getting a team site. But that's not the case. It's just that that's a that's a managed path, right? It's different because we're reusing the same term for twenty things well, and expected to understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I need to create a Teams team for my team. <laughs> With a subsite on the Teams subsite. <laughs> yep. Well, the third point here is that so it seems to me that if I start at the parent level with a communication template site, I can create subsites with either the Teams template or the communications template. Is that right? I believe so. I'd have to test that. But I, no, I think it's, the subsites are the same. I didn't get that far in my research yet, so. Yeah, Neil, I think I also heard that Sherry was volunteering to take some homework. <laughs> I heard it. I, 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 I verify. <laughs> like, like I said, people argue with me that when they said, no, the structure should be flat. We shouldn't be having subsites anymore. But I do believe there's a place for that. So I'd be, I could write a blog post on that and then refer yeah. back if you want. What's well, interesting too, off of each of those templates, whether you can go and create. I thought, again, this is, I'd have to go and play around, but communication sites were kind of an end node. But yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we've so got, Sherry, we've got that assigned homework, and I'll, I'll follow up with you on that. Oh, well, communication site and team sites, when you create a new site collection, they have the same functionality. It's just how the, the home page is presented and what content is populated by default from that template. You can build whatever you can. It doesn't mean you can't put a hero web part on a collaboration page and make that the home page of a team site, it's just whatever content you were hoping to start from. So I wouldn't know why there would be a different option for sub sites underneath the two different options. So what's the longer conversation around Matthew's questions of what are you trying to accomplish? Getting caught up in what templates and what should be in each of the different places like you can go and build whatever you need to do there. It just how much overhead, how much management will it require based on if you move away from the standard, uh, you know, the out of the box, uh, um, you know, templates or or navigation. Well, and make sure you plan it. That's the biggest thing that people fall short on is they don't plan their structure, their architecture 
correctly and then they just start building stuff that doesn't fit together and then that's why people like me as a consultant have a job because <laughs> they want us to come in and clean up their mess because they have 20 sites that are doing the same thing because uh, nobody sat down and planned it out together so so you know i don't know if you saw there was a uh, so mark cashman and sue handley published an information architecture kind of shortcut guide that's awesome. Um, okay, let me let me find the link here. Yes, I I will. Fo I follow Sue, and I will. Um, she's my spirit animal. <laughs> like, <laughs> she's, like, she's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Before I joined this community, I had people say, "Do you have anyone else like you?" And I just said, "Really, no." But now I do. Like, so it's awesome. I love Sue. <laughs> she's amazing, and Mark too. You know, obviously. Yeah, Mark's okay. I guess <laughs> he's all right. A lot of my children's reading material came from Sue, from her kids when they were done. She had a bunch of uh, young children's books that she gave to us when we were in D.C. Uh, one time for like a, a SharePoint Saturday or something, and we took them back. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kept a few that my children loved dearly in, in the anticipation that they have kids someday. But we did the same thing. We uh, donated them to the school um, and to a preschool. So yep. got to share the love. That, uh, I just saw that uh, Gennady had a, uh, um, a, a Cashman coffee cup. <laughs> really? That's awesome. Hmm. Um, I want a Cashman coffee cup. And do, 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 come on, where is this? Uh, right, so, I'll I'll continue to look, and I'm not for some reason. Why am I not finding that? I'll see if I can find it. If you want to go to the next question, All right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Question number fifteen. Uh, Peter says, "Hi guys, how are you doing? How do you restrict members of the group from accessing the group recordings on the channel?" So you've got a channel, you've recorded meetings, you've recorded group recordings, and now you want to restrict access to those things. Well, okay. Those recordings go to OneDrive now, right? Well, that was my question. It depends. Where was it stored to? Because it was in stream or is it in a library? If it's in the library, you can change the permissions on it. But yeah. and stream, yeah, stream, right? Stream everyone in the group, everyone in the meeting has access. But with what with the newer, when we had the, we had the homework, remember last time? Christian had the homework about understanding why we'd moved it to OneDrive. Um, so that would then be in a library, so you could modify the permissions. It's one of those questions that needs more illusion. Elucidation, to use a posh word. <laughs> nice one, Neil. I read that somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I was still looking for the link because here it is. Is it this one? It is the IA value. Oh, so that's back from July. I'm just looking on her white papers on her site. Oh, this is it right here. Okay. So I'll add that to the link to the last one as well. All right. Uh, so we got six more minutes to see if we can. One or two more here. Uh, number 16. Jonas asks, my company is in the process of deploying Teams throughout the company, and I want to be able to use Teams to do status reports and track monthly goals. Is there a feature already embedded to do this? Any advice on how to track projects from the engineering perspective? 
kind of goes back to some of the answers that we had. I mean, like there's different different things here, like one tool to rule them all, to track mm -hmm. projects from an engineering perspective. You've got Planner for the lightweight, flexible, more ad hoc side. You have DevOps, which is what most, you know, technical engineering organizations are using DevOps more and more, which is, you know, again, that, that Kanban uh, management, yeah. but, you know, over within- DevOps or Jira. Yep. Azure DevOps or third-party solution Jira. Mm -hmm. uh, for status reports, I mean, look, there's so many different ways that you could do that. SharePoint site, you know, planner, a power app with a form, um, a, a list where people upload uh, or fill out the list directly. I mean, depends like what what flavor do you prefer well and power bi dashboards based on a sharepoint list to be able yep. to mm -hmm. if they're looking for a real scorecard yep. that's what came to mind for me yep yeah i'd agree with Shari. that's what we do um and my team you know i i track i'm running with about 50 customers right now um we have a we have a custom crm for tracking that but the basically the back end there's there's literally a list right that's it uh, we use sql but it's effectively putting the um power bi dashboard on top of that sql list uh, um allows us to track and build custom rules and custom reporting and flag you know this report this project's running late this project's on target all of that kind of stuff you can do power bi um, integrates really well I just realized that question seven, the next one, 17, is pretty much the same question. Same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don says, mm -hmm. I would mm -hmm. like to create a company scorecard to keep track of the weekly goals and performance. Yeah, Power BI dashboard for that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, each department could have their own data and later consolidate to one. That's how you do that roll up. Yeah, the biggest problem there, I think, is it says the department user should not access other departments' data, but can access to the company dashboard. So the dashboard's going to have to be published as a separate entity and not, like if it's Power BI, if you don't have access to the underlying data, yeah. you're not going to see the dashboard at all. Right. So it's, well, it's, 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 those... it's, achie it's, it's achievable, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just pulling from those different data sources. You don't have to have direct access to the data source, but can see the view of that consolidated data source. So that's the way to do that. Mm -hmm. And you have to turn off the drill down in Power BI so that they can't get yeah. to... Yeah. Deeper, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of where I was going. They want to see the the top level, but not see all of the all the sausage making factory underneath. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I use that phrase a lot. Uh, number. So the last question that I had captured here. Let's see if we can uh, round it out here in a minute and a half. Eslam uh, uh, says I have a macro code added via all the Excel sheets in an Office 365 group that allows users to send emails from the Excel sheet itself. And we now, we have now thousands of these sheets. <laughs> My yeah, question right. is if I need to change the SMTP mail as an example or change anything in the macro code and need this change to be applied across all the other sheets, is there a cloud based on a third party app that can do that? <laughs> God, if you write one, it's like just because I, you can does really not mean you yeah. should. <laughs> yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh! Well, a you cannot have macro enabled um, sheets in a library. You have to. You can't open them in the browser. You have to open them directly. Oh my goodness! I'm so yeah. Just because you can does not mean you should. Is <laughs> there's a ew, solution ew, ew. design scenario here? Icky, Sean. icky, icky, icky. Yeah. <laughs> Sean's going to have I nightmares mean, for it, days on this one. <laughs> I, I, I would say the most, probably, there's no good answer to this, but I think one yeah. possibility is if you need to change the SMT mail, and it's it, it sounds to me like there's thousands of sheets and all of this mail is going to the same location, since he's saying, how can I change it all? Create an alias for that that's the thought. email address and yeah, and yes. you and then you just need to change the yeah. alias yeah that's what i would do and the given, but i think the solution's not right yeah the solution's not yep. 
needs to be redesigned, but that would give them a shortcut. Yeah. yeah. If it's just a list of data, then to me, why is that not just a list in a SharePoint site or a Microsoft list now? I, I don't know why people are still using it. Um, Excel to a date as a database when there's better tools. Uh, <laughs> so it's not just yeah, I, I'm sorry. This is a this is a person. We had that last week. Of, we of a, a tale of an access database that I built a long while ago. That uh, that the people decided they wanted to move to Excel, which they did, and uh, <laughs> I'm still left yeah. speechless. Yeah, yeah. I wrote it. Embedded with tons of VBA code. <laughs> Yuck. Excel is not an RDBMS. Well, that's okay. You you can you can you can drive a nail with a pipe wrench. <laughs> yeah. Well, all you've got is a hammer. Everything looks so, like a nail. So I think Eslam, you have all of us are we uh you have all of our sympathies with this one. <laughs> yeah. And on that high note this episode of Office Hours, and thank you for watching. Of course, I'll have the blog post up on Buckley Planet, um, at hopefully by end of day today, uh, which will have the uh, link list to every question that's covered, as all of the links that we've shared in our chat, so you didn't have to take copious notes around those if you didn't catch them. Um, share all the links there, but you can find that on buckleyplanet.com. Of course, uh, the recording out on uh, YouTube, uh, out on the CollabTech channel, so be sure to subscribe and join us. We'll be back at 8 a.m. Pacific, and time is changing, everyone, so get ready to lose an hour of sleep here in the U.S., at least. Uh, that's happening, what, Sunday? S Saturday night, Sunday morning? Yeah. Uh, no, that's you because know, Europe, Europe, Europe go two weeks later. Yeah. That's fine. Well, at yeah. least at least we're not traveling anymore and having to change. Usually on Spring Ahead weekend, I am going to the East Coast, and then I lose like three hours. And but Hal brutal. doesn't have to change at all. <laughs> he's, not, he's at nope. Island. There's like two or three locations in the U.S. that don't don't need to change. But anyway, well, yeah. thank you all for joining on the panel. Thanks for those that are watching, and we'll we'll catch you next week for the next live show. Have a good Absolutely, day. it was great with bells on. Thanks, gentlemen. Bye. Bye. Yep. Bye. 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 Let the light shine through